you pray over the message, please? Lord, God, we again thank you for the awesome privilege of prayer, Father. We pray that you bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thinking about these these verses and what we're going to focus on this morning as we've been going through this, this morning in particular, we're going to be just looking at verse 13. And we're coming kind of toward the end of, of this prayer. And, and next week, Lord willing, we will look at that part, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's in some of the scriptures. It's not in others. And we'll discuss why that's there. Um, but this morning, we're just going to deal with verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or, as some translations say, evil one. And both of those are, are completely accurate. But here's the thing I want us to remember, and, and this, is, this is absolutely true. Christian... And what I mean by that is is those who have been purchased by the blood of Jesus, you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you are a child of God. You and I are in a war. And it's a serious war and there are battles in this war every single day. And the problem is, is we don't get a day where we can just decide, you know what, I'm tired. I need a little leave. I need some R&R. I'm just going to, I'm going to take a break today. We don't, we don't get that option. Because our enemy who's fighting against us ruthlessly, he doesn't stop fighting. And so we can't give up. It's just not an option for Christians to give up fighting this war that we're in. And specifically what we're going to be talking about today is this this battle over temptation. Because temptation is coming at us constantly by the evil one. And, And this was a verse that came to me just in... Final prep this morning going through this. And the writer of Hebrews says this. And it's Hebrews chapter 12 verse 4. It says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Anybody here resisted against sin, the the temptation of sin? Have you resisted against any kind of sin to the point of shedding your blood? If we haven't, why not? Because it's worth that much. It's worth sin is that serious of an issue. And temptation and fighting this is worth that much. And as the writer of Hebrews says this, it's not, it's not you know, kind of a, uh, uh, that a boy that you haven't done this. It's why haven't you done this? Why haven't you or are you willing to go this far against the fight against sin That's, that we're all in? This is the war that we're in. And here's the reality of it. We must, as Christians, fight The good fight. We have to. And you think about this. You think about the Apostle Paul. The last words that he pretty much said, it's in the last context of anything that he wrote down. So it's in his final thoughts, his final words to to Timothy. It's in 2 Timothy. And he writes this. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And it really boils down to that. It really boils down to keeping the faith. We have to keep the faith. So the question that we begin with is, are, if we're in a war, there's battles every day, are we fighting the good fight? Are we fighting, are we resisting to the point of shedding our own blood? And here's the reality in that. I think that we have all failed at some point in this. We've all failed. Anybody here ever not sinned? Good. Excellent. So we've all sinned. That's what that means. If you didn't raise your hand, we've all sinned. And you think about that. If we've all sinned, then that means we've all given in to temptation at some point. We have failed in some degree when it comes to this. So it's time for a change. I mean, you may be failing right now in this area. You may be having temptation fall upon you over and over and over again. And, and you're, not, you're not successful in your struggle against it. Well, it's time for a change. And so what do we do when it's time to change? Do we just kind of pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and say, I got to try harder? We take it to our father. We go to him in prayer and dealing with this context of learning how to pray. Jesus teaching us to pray. Please don't forget that every single one of these petitions that we are taught to give to our father begins or should begin, can begin with our father in heaven. We can take all that to him. So in verse 13, we can say, our father in heaven, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We can approach him as our father. And and what what a blessing that is to be able to go to the father, the God of all creation, but to know him as father through his son, Jesus Christ, and to be able to bring our petitions to him in humility, but yet with boldness through the blood of Christ. 
And so you think about this. Let's reverse this for a minute. How many of us would actually pray for God to lead us into temptation? Anybody? Are you here? Are you awake? (laughs) I hope you are. That would absolutely be silly to ask God, God, today I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling fit spiritually. Lead me into temptation because I got it. That's stupid. That's silly. But here's the reality of it. That's not what we're asking because temptation is going to come your way. Anybody been tempted? You don't have to get specific, but just raise your hand. Anybody been tempted this morning with anything? (laughs) So those of you who didn't raise your hand, you will be tempted later. I can assure you of that. It's coming. But here's the reality. Temptation is not sin. Please understand that. Temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted. Did he sin? No. No. Hey, two people are here. Good. Jesus was tempted. Did he sin? No. Good. That means he was absolutely sinless in every single way, but yet tempted as we are. So he can help us in those times and he knows our frailty. When we are tempted, we can come to him and he gives us deliverance. But temptation is not sin. But let's let's kind of flesh this out a little bit. What is sin? Anybody want to give an answer? What is sin? What, what is sin? Going against God's will. Going against God's will. Anybody else? Come on, can I give him an answer? Give me. Sin is anyone of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So either you don't keep his law um, or you uh, inadvertently intentionally break it. Okay. Anybody else? Everybody's scared. <laughs> a lot error. of times. What's that? Error. Error. Well, I'm going to give you a, a definition of sin, and this is not my definition. A lot of times when, when, when I say the word sin, sometimes we think of specific sins too. We think of what certain sins are. You may ask somebody on the street, what is sin? And they'll start naming stuff too. Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a definition of sin, and this is, this is a foolproof definition of sin. You can't go wrong when you take the definition strictly from the Bible. And here's what it is. It's from Romans chapter 14, verse 23. It's pretty simple. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now you think about that. And you think about your life. And you think about things that you have done that maybe you didn't think were sin, but they also didn't involve faith. What does that mean? There are times we've sinned that, again, as in the the catechism answer, we have done it and haven't even realized we've done it. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we come to this portion in the scripture in verse 13. And it's, again, it's a petition. We're asking our Heavenly Father to not lead us in to temptation. Let me clear something up, because this is something I, I think that, that as Christians we sometimes need to have re-preached, maybe preached for the first time, about who God is, about who we are as Christians, and about where he leads us on this path as we live out our lives and our faith in this world. So do me a favor, mark your page there in Matthew chapter 6, but turn to James chapter 1. Spend a little time in James chapter 1 this morning. James chapter 1, when you, when you get away from the greeting of James being a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you, and you get into verse 2, we begin a context, really, that I think follows pretty much all the way through. There's kind of a parenthesis in there, but it pretty much follows all the way through to at least verse 18. And that whole context is trials and tribulations. Because we find out right in the beginning, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. When you meet these, these things that are happening in your life that you don't necessarily, and, and I'm, I have this in my notes somewhere, I don't even know where I have it, but I'm just going to say it. Don't ask God to test your faith. Okay? Don't. And I've shared my, my own history with that where I I asked God once to, to test my faith. Do you remember that, Sarah? Sarah remembers it very clearly. I remember you said at the time too, I think you said, what has he prayed for? You said something like that at the time, but but I did. I, I was oh were we even working toward the mission field yet? I don't remember if we were or not. I think we maybe were. But anyway, I wanted to make sure my faith wasn't all loosey-goosey, wishy-washy, all this stuff, you know. And, and I may have shared this story with you before, but it probably 
It's a good time to share it again. I just said, Lord, test my faith. And I didn't say test it like because I'm super, super strong and I'm like the most amazing man of faith. Test it so I can make sure it's real. Because I want it to be real and I want it to be holy in you and, and just all for you. And guess what? Oh man, God answered my prayer. Sarah, how did he answer my prayer? You remember? Yeah, I won't show you the scar, but it's, but it's here. It's from here to here. And, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, I think it's beautiful. I can make it smile if I want to. But, what's that? Yeah, scars are cool, yeah. But the thing about it was, is, is that wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, I, I don't know. How, how close are we ever to death? I mean, we're really not closer to death. If, if it's not our time, we're, we're, not, we're not close to death. We don't have a foot in the grave. We'll go when it's our time to go. But things weren't good physically for me leading up to that point. Um, five days in the hospital, six weeks recovery at home. And, but that wasn't, that wasn't the testing of my faith. The testing of my faith came in that, okay, I... I work an hourly job full time in addition to serving in the church. How am I going to provide for my family? I didn't have those, those kind of benefits. How, how am I going to do this? Because six weeks and, and I've got no way to work. I physically I worked in a warehouse to where I'm lifting stuff, boxes all the time. Could not do that. And I get a call from, from my boss who is a believer, just a, an awesome man of God. And he calls me up, I think... I don't know, maybe the next day after I got out of the hospital, maybe a couple days. God let me sweat it a little bit. He calls me up and he says, look, um, I know you can't work for six weeks. I'm just going to pay you like you're working. Amen. And it was like, praise God. I mean, that was it. That was, that was God. That was, that was all him because I was struggling of, all right, God, how am I going to provide? No, God, how are you going to provide? How? And, but, but I say all this and I kind of chase a rabbit with that story. Don't ask God to test your faith. Because your faith will be tested. You don't need to ask for it. It's going to happen. It's going to come. Because we will meet trials of various kinds. And when we do that, we're supposed to count it all joy. Because here's the process in this. When we meet these trials, it's about testing of our faith, which is supposed to produce steadfastness. Which steadfastness will have a full effect. And what it's doing is, it, what it's, doing is it's equipping us as believers so that we're not lacking. But then you jump down to verse 5 and we begin to see if any of you lacks wisdom. Remember the context. The context of this is in the midst of your trials. It's not just I lack wisdom in, in you know, the weather or something like that. It's I'm lacking wisdom in what's going on. God, teach me what I'm supposed to learn in the midst of this trial. So if you lack wisdom in the midst of the trial that God has led you in. That's the important key here. God has led you in this trial. Why do I say this? Because first off, he says, count it joy. If it wasn't him that was leading it, is he saying count joy in this? God has a purpose in this. So he says, if you lack wisdom, ask him. If you're in the midst of a trial, ask him. And he'll give it to you because he gives generously without reproach. And it will be given to you. But then you come down to verse 12, and this, this is why we're still in the context of this trial. He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So again, the writer of Hebrews, or James, I'm sorry, is still dealing with trials in, in this situation. But then we come to verse 13. Verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So first off, here's the reality of it. When you're in the midst of a trial, and in the midst of that trial, and God has led you in this trial, there is going to be within that trial temptations. I kind of look at it like this. I kind of view the trial sort of vis you know, visually. Here's the trial, and within that trial, there's going to be temptations that come about. Because again, your faith is being tested and God wants your faith tested so that it produces a steadfastness, something that's stronger after the fact than it was in the beginning. And so when you're in the midst of your trial, and it's not a trial because of sin, you, you haven't veered off the course, you're following God faithfully, and he's led you into this trial, and then in the midst of that you're being tempted, don't blame God. Don't reach out and say, God, why are you tempting me in this manner? Because James says very clearly, again, dealing in the context of trials, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. You need to learn this theology about God. He cannot be tempted with evil. 
and he himself tempts no one. So if you're tempted in any manner, way, shape, or form, it is not from God. Know that. Trust that and believe it and put it to practice. And then he comes to verse 14. But each person is tempted, and so here's when the temptation comes, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Lured, lured and enticed. What, is that, what image does that bring to anybody's mind? Any idea? Fishing. Are you fish? You, you throw that, George, I, I saw that you had done some fishing. I assume you didn't do that with a bare hook. Am I correct? <laughs> you threw it out. You had some kind of bait. You were trying to, you had a lure probably. You, you, you were bringing that in. You were trying to entice that fish out of a comfort zone so it would let its guard down and bite on your hook and then you could reel it in. You had it. That's exactly what we're being taught here about temptation. Lured and enticed. But here's the reality of it. Sometimes we look at that and we just say, oh, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. And then we stop there. That's not where we stop. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. Something inside of us. It's our desire that is being tempted upon to break faith and not trust God and then live that that unfaithfulness out and bear the fruit of sin. Here's the reality. We have an enemy, and he knows us pretty well. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. But he knows us well enough to tempt us. I'm giving a little secret. Temptation's not from God. Who's it from? It's from Satan. Because the purpose of temptation is that you fail and fall into sin. God doesn't want that in your life. He will test you, which is different so that your faith grows, Satan will tempt you so that your faith fails. So as we fall into this, and this is happening, our enemy exploits or tries to take advantage of those areas and desires in us that God is trying to squeeze out. I kind of like this, and in a way, God turns the tables on Satan. Because again, even when we're tempted, that's part of the trial. And again, resisting temptation is a building aspect of our faith. But again, our enemy isn't, isn't, he's not part of that, wanting our faith to grow. He wants our faith to be eclipsed. He wants our faith to fail so that we would fail God and turn away from God. And, and that's ultimately what he wants. So the reality is, now we look back into James, but each person, when, when you are tempted, and when I am tempted, it's because we're being lured and enticed by our own desire. Something within us that, that, that can pull us away. Something that's there that we're predisposed to in some way, shape, or form that will lead us astray from God. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives, gives, brings forth, I'm sorry, death. Did you, did you catch that? We're lured and enticed by desires and and things within us. And then when we kind of bite on that hook and we're finally there, it's going to bring about sin because when you give in to temptation, that's sin because there's no faith involved there. And then that will eventually give birth to death. It will bring forth death. Think about this now in the midst of this trial because let me jump to verse 17 because verse 17 is kind of a good verse. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now, we read that verse, and oftentimes we pluck that out of context, and that's, that's okay to some degree. But if you look at it within the context, what's the context? Trials. So, if every good and perfect gift, and he's not talking about temptation, and he's not talking about those desires that are within us, he must be talking about the trials. So, the trials that God gives us are good and perfect gifts from above, They come down from him. He allows us to walk through them because he wants our faith tested to produce steadfastness. But within that, we have pockets and and seasons, if you want to call it that, of temptation. In the midst of them, there are desires in our flesh that want to lead us away. And that's the battle. That's the real fight. Flesh versus faith. The Apostle Paul was in it. You can read Romans 7. You can understand where he was in all of that. It's a real battle. And you and I are not immune to it. If you think that you are immune to that battle, you have lost it already. We don't get to let our guard down. So first off, again, God is not tempting you. 
Satan is tempting you. The trials have a purpose. But if you give in to that temptation, what's the opposite of life? Death. There's no growth there. God wants us to grow in our faith. And so here's some realities that we need to remember as Christians. And Matt, this was really cool because you were in Galatians chapter 6 in Sunday school. And I've got some verses from Galatians 5 and 6. So listen to this and and store these away because you're going to need them. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 says, And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So wait a minute. When we're tempted, we're tempted because we have within us our own desires and there's these passions. But in Christ, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So this is a reality for us as Christians. It's true. You can say, well, I don't remember doing that. When you came to faith in Christ, you did that. If you were truly born again, that has been done. So now what we need to do is start living in that reality. That when those passions and desires come up and that temptation and that you see that hook and it's, oh, it's beautiful. It's just spinning right there. It looks so shiny and you just, you're hungry and you just want to latch on to it. That's when you remind yourself, wait a minute, I belong to Christ Jesus. And that means that my flesh and my passions within me, they've been crucified. And then that thing doesn't look so shiny. In fact, it becomes somewhat like a worldly wise man tried to do with Christian. It becomes odious to us. We don't want it in our mouths. We don't want to take the bite anymore. So we realize, we preach to ourselves, wait a minute, this passion and desire that's welling up in me, it has been crucified with Christ. Now, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Paul talking says, Before be it for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the verses that you shared. I was, I was, I was like jumping inside. I was like, man, because I'll be honest with you, Matt. Shame on me. I don't study the Sunday school lesson. I don't. Um, so I'm not stealing from you, but I get a lot out of it. So if you're not in Sunday school, come because you'll get a lot out of it. But he says, Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Here's what one commentary says about this. The world was dead to Paul. And it says, the world was destroyed in its power to attract him. The world had no power anymore. It wasn't shiny and spinny and enticing for him to bite on that lure anymore, to bite on that hook. But the other side of that too is that Paul, and I quote, was dead to the desires and attractions of the world. So the world wasn't enticing him, and Paul was dead to to that stuff anyway. So again, that's what we need to have in our lives, because we should be boasting in the cross of Christ. We should be boasting in what Jesus has done for us, and it all begins at the cross. It all begins what has already been done. It begins when our sins are transferred to Jesus, and we trust in him fully, and we take all of our abilities to save ourselves and just cast them on him and say, I can't do this. Not in one ounce, I can't save myself. So I trust fully, Jesus, in what you've done, that you paid the price for my sins, that you've taken them to the grave and you're raised from the dead. You're able to save to the uttermost. That's the gospel, and that's what we trust in when we look to the cross. If you want to have the world crucified to you and you want to be crucified to it, you first have to look to the cross and see Jesus crucified. And see him dying in your place and then raised from the dead so that you can be raised to new life. And here's what we get. We start at the cross. We trust in Christ. We get a father in heaven. Not only do we get a father in heaven, you and I become new creations in Christ. We're born again. Not only that, we get the Holy Spirit. He now indwells us. He lives inside of us. But what also we should get is a hatred of sin. We should hate sin. When we sin, we should hate it. We should hate it more than anybody else. And I don't mean hate it just because of maybe the results of it. But we should hate it when we're convicted of it because we realize that that's why Jesus died. It's a glorious thing, but that's indeed why the sinless Son of God died in my place. Because I've sinned. That should bring humility in our lives. We should hate our sin. But also, when we come to faith in Christ, we should have an awareness of temptation. We should understand temptation when it comes, what it is. And we should also have a crucifixion of our desires and our passions that are within us. And we should be living that out. So here's how we should approach this verse. We're back in Matthew chapter 6. And lead us not into temptation. We should approach it like this. Father, 
We don't want to sin against you. We don't want to sin against you. We want to hate sin so much that when it is enticing and it, and it, and it throws its hook out and it casts it in our direction, that we don't even want to bite on it because we don't want to sin against you. And here's the reality in this prayer. We just asked him to forgive us of our sins. And then not only that, we asked him to forgive those who've sinned against us. So then we're now asking him, don't lead us into temptation, because if I'm led into temptation, then there's a very good chance that me and my flesh, I'm going to be enticed, I'm going to take hold of it, and that's going to give birth to sin, which ultimately gives birth to death. Here's the the weirdness of this. If we just ask for forgiveness and we believe that he granted us that, it's like having a venomous snake and picking it up, Anybody do that? Yeah, I figured you cannon boys would. Yeah. Have you done them? Have you been bit by one? Pardon? Have you been bit by one? No. Okay, let's, let's use you as an example, Kenny. You pick up a venomous snake, and it bites you, okay? You, I'm sure you would throw it down, but let's say you get the anti-venom, and, and Matt's there to, to suck the poison out of your hand, and it's a beautiful picture of brotherly love. That's right. All right, you're healed, you're doing good, swelling's gone down. Would you pick up that snake again? No, 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 probably not. Here's the reality. We've just said, Father, forgive us of our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation. So it's crazy to just be forgiven of something like a snake that just bit you and poisoned you, wants your death, to then pick that thing up again. It's kind of like this. I don't know if I've ever told this story. Have you guys ever heard the story of the snake who was at the bottom of the mountain and wanted to get to the top? You ever heard that story? There's a snake, and, and he wants to get to the top, and, and it's too far. And let's see, who do we want to pick on? Sherman. Pick on Sherman. You're there. Your eyes are bright. I can see you're paying attention. So Sherman is walking, and Sherman has got a really brisk pace, and he's going to the top of this mountain. So the snake stops and says, hey, Sherman, will you give me a ride? Sherman says, <laughs> sorry, fellas. Sherman says, I'm not picking you up. I'm not taking you anywhere. You're a snake, and I know you're going to bite me, and if you bite me, I might die. Snake says, ah, oh, come on, Sherman. I'm not going to bite you. Just give me a ride to the top. I promise I will not bite you. Sherman sits there, and he thinks a little while, and snake, you know, it's, it's got nice words, and, and he doesn't look that threatening. You know, he kind of curled up to him and just kind of rubbed his Rubbed his little nose against you, Sherman. So Sherman decides, you know what? It would be a good thing to help this this snake out. I mean, he needs help. So Sherman picks it up, puts it on its shoulder. The snake is just riding. They're having great conversation. You're working your way up to the top. And finally, you get there. And all of a sudden, you look at the snake, Sherman, and guess what he does to you? He He bites you. Yeah, he bites you. And as you're... Slowly having the venom course. It's a bad example I used you. Slowly the venom is coursing through your veins. You look at the snake and you say, why would you bite me? You promised you wouldn't. And the snake says, I'm a snake. That's what I do. Here's the reality with temptation. Temptation is going to bite you. Amen. I promise. So if you've just been bit and you've been forgiven, don't pick it up again because if you do and it bites you and you look at it and say, you promised not to bite me, temptation is going to say, hey, I'm temptation. It's what I do. And that ultimately will bring about sin, which brings about death. So we're asking our Father, lead us not into temptation. He will not lead you into temptation. He's not going to do that. And then we come to the second part, and or but... And that's an important contrast there. But deliver us from evil or from the evil one. And that idea there of evil, what it literally means in the Greek, it means pain-ridden, or this is kind of interesting, the inevitable agonies or misery that always go with evil. That's what we want delivered from. And ultimately, who is behind that? The evil one, Satan. So, Father, we're asking that you lead us not into temptation. And if I'm following you, and that's why we shared that scripture from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He's leading us. And even if he's leading us, what do we sometimes have to walk through? The valley of the shadow of death. See, the psalmist was being led. The psalmist isn't saying, well, I veered off the path, I sinned, I've gone the wrong direction, and now I'm looking around and I'm in the middle of the valley of shadow of death and I don't like it. It never says in that psalm, in fact, it says just the opposite. It says that he's leading me to all these places. 
And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, guess what? He's still there with you. He's still there with me. His rod and his staff, they give us comfort in the midst of that, which shows us that, yes, sometimes following God and not veering off the path will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. Just don't stop there. Keep on going through there and then ask God, God, please lead me not into temptation because I don't want to sin against you. Because I know if I'm tempted, it's because I have these desires that are within me. And I don't want to give life to these dead things that have been crucified. So, Father, please lead me not in that direction, but deliver me from evil. Deliver me from the evil one. Deliver me from the miseries and the agony that go along with this. Remind me of this, God. Remember Sherman and the snake. Remember that. Remember Kenny picking up the snake twice and being bit. That was silly of you. Remember that. Don't do it. Don't do it. And this is kind of funny because this is sort of how we, we discipline our kids. And, and, and uh, yeah, we, we spank our kids. Okay? Anybody else here spank your kids? You're all in trouble with me. <laughs> I come knocking on the door next week. All right, anybody who said they spanked their kids, line up. Going to, hey, we'll, we'll have a worship time in jail. We'll sing hymns. It'll be fun. It'll be great. Anyway, one of the things that... that Always when it is, Evan's not in here. One of the times when Evan gets a spanking, his big thing is he goes crazy and says, is it going to hurt? Is it going to hurt? That's like he just goes nuts. Is it going to hurt me, Dad? And I said, well, son, yeah, it's going to hurt because it's supposed to hurt. And I'm not talking about beating your kids. That's why God gave kids this right here so you can spank it and it's not going to kill them. The Bible says that it's not going to kill them. But I said to him, it's going to hurt so that the next time you want to do what you did wrong, you'll remember the pain that was associated with the act, and you'll say, I'm not picking up that snake again. That hurt too much. That's how we should approach this. If we have fallen into temptation, and then we've dealt with the sin, but yet been forgiven, don't pick it up again. Remember what the misery that was involved in it and then ask God for strength not to pick this up because again, God, I need your help in this temptation because it's in here, it's in me. I've got this desire for it. If you didn't desire it in the least, Satan wouldn't tempt you with it. But I need deliverance, God, from this. You go to him and I promise you every time you go to him in the midst of temptation, he will deliver you. He will give you a way out. But again, it all starts with the cross. I mean, that's the greatest deliverance we ever get. It starts with Jesus' death and resurrection, true deliverance. You want to be delivered from evil and the evil one? Go to the cross. That's ultimate deliverance from him. And this is daily deliverance from him. Resist the devil and he will do what? Flee. Flee. You know, that word flee, I I don't get the impression of just kind of a slow walking away. I mean, flee. Anybody here ever flee anything? Do you ever run from anything for your life? You don't trot. You sprint. And the Bible says, resist him, and he flees. He gets out of there. So let's expand this a little bit. This will be our closing prayer. Let's, let's just take verse 13 and apply it to our prayer life. Let's, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are our Father for all eternity. Through your son that you sent to die on the cross for our sins. We are forever given to you, presented to you. We are part of your family. Nothing is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus, we're held in the palm of your hand. Father, we're held in your hand because you and the son are one. You have us. You hold us. And we're yours through Christ and we praise you for that. But Father, we deal, we are in a war and you know that. That's why we have Jesus as our high priest who was tempted just like we are, but yet was without sin completely. And he is now ministering on our behalf. So you understand when we are tempted, you understand our frailty. And so God, we're asking you as our father, as your children, we're we're crying out to you, our father in heaven, lead us not into temptation. We know that you're not going to tempt us. You're not even capable. Uh, You're you're not tempted by evil, nor are you even capable of tempting us with evil. So keep our feet on the path. 
God. Keep us following you daily, consciously. Please forgive us, God, when we have let our guard down and fallen asleep. Because we all have. But help us, God. And we're not, we're not talking about sinless perfection here. Because again, if we're tempted, it's because we have desires inside of us. But God, remind us, those desires have been crucified. And so, Father, lead us not in the path of temptation. You won't do that. Give us victory over temptation that it wouldn't give birth to sin. But, Father, deliver us from evil and from the evil one who wants to devour us because he hates you. God, help us in this. We are helpless. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Holy Spirit, you're so willing to help us, but if we try to attempt this in our flesh, we will fail every time. Help us in the midst of temptation. And God, as you lead us in trials, and and you have purposes in these, God, give us the mindset and, and, and the wisdom, Lord, to come to you in the midst of trials and say, God, what is it that you're teaching me? But in the midst of these trials, as we are tempted, may we never blame you. You're not tempting us. But when we are tempted, you give us a way of escape. Always, God, you always do that. So help us, Father, in our frailty, in our humanity. You remember that we are dust, but still we are raised out of that dust to the glorious heights of heaven where we reign supreme with your Son. Thank you for that. So, Father, guide our path. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.